Hello and welcome to lecture 33 of Math 2003. In today's lecture we're going to be looking at section 7b on the spectral theorem. So we're kind of getting into kind of some more complex stuff so I'll hopefully go as slow as possible and try to kind of uh, tell you what the main idea is that you want to latch on to. So kind of want to recall back in chapter 5 okay when we looked at uh, operators, we showed that in some cases there might be nice bases for the operator so that the matrix associated to the operator is nice. Okay, so what do we mean by nice here? We mean it could either be maybe upper triangular or maybe it could be diagonal. And as we saw later on, you could also pick a basis so that it has like a Jordan form. So that uh, shows that for any operator, you know, you could pick a, a nice basis. And what we want to do today's lecture, kind of part of today's lecture, is show that if we assume that our operator is normal, or if we assume that it's self-adjoint, then we can actually show that right away that we can guarantee bases so that we can make things to be diagonal. So that, that's kind of the thing that you want to keep in the back of your mind. Okay, and I'll just make myself disappear here. Uh, the main thing that you want to pay attention to is that there's actually different results depending upon the field. So different results if f is either the complex numbers or the real numbers. So we, we don't see too many of these results in Math 2003 where the where the coefficients, the, uh, the set where the coefficient comes in affects your results. Uh, but definitely this sort of thing pops up when you're dealing with inner products because the definition kind of, uh, uh, you have to pay it, when you're dealing with inner product spaces, you have to really pay attention whether you're using the complex numbers or the real numbers. So just pay attention that there are kind of two different results depending upon whether we're at the complex numbers or the real numbers. And we're going to start with the complex case where we're going to look at what's called the complex spectral theorem. Okay, so what does this theorem says? I'll walk you through it. So suppose that the, uh, your, your vector space is over the complex numbers and T is a linear operator on your vector space. Then the following are equivalent. Okay, the operator is normal. Okay, so remember that means the adjoint of T uh, composed with T is the same thing as the, uh, sorry, I said that in the wrong order. T composed with the adjoint is the same thing as the adjoint composed with T. The next thing is that V has an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors of T. And the third thing is that uh, the associated matrix is, is a diagonal matrix with respect to some orthonormal basis of V. So what the complex spectral theorem is saying is that if your operator has the property that the eigenvectors of that T for, you can make the eigenvectors of T form an orthonormal basis for the vector space P, then that T would have to be a normal operator. And at the same time, if it's a normal operator, you get a diagonal matrix if you use that basis. Okay, so let's just kind of walk through the proof. Now, in fact, there's really not much to prove that B is equivalent to C, right? This is in fact um, theorem 5 Point four part one. So hopefully I got that reference right. Let me just double check while I'm sitting here. Uh, grab the textbook and just let me explain why. Because in chapter five we were looking at what it means for. Um, sorry, I think it's forty one. Sorry, yeah. This is five point forty one, and because theorem. 5.41 says that you have uh, a matrix who, that is diagonal if and only if it has a basis of eigenvectors. And then the new thing that we're adding is, well, if you have an or orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, then it's diagonal with respect to that uh, orthonormal basis. And the same thing, if that basis is orthonormal, gives you the diagonal matrix, then that that basis is eigenvectors and they're orthonormal. So it really just follows from what we did in chapter five. So B and C is not really new, we're just adding the adjective orthonormal to this. So 
the new thing that we're getting is that if it's orthonormal, then the operator has to be um, normal, okay, or the equivalence of being normal. So let's kind of walk through the proof of that. Okay, so what we need here is actually Shure's theorem, which we proved in a you know, quite recent lecture. So suppose V is an inner product space over C, and by Shure's theorem, there is an orthonormal, orthonormal basis E1, E2, up to En of V, such that this matrix here, the matrix associated to this linear transformation is upper triangular. Okay, so we know that we can already find an orthonormal basis that makes the matrix upper triangular. Now, we, our end goal right, is to make this matrix diagonal, but right now Schurz theorem only tells me that I can make it upper triangular. So let's make an upper triangular matrix. and so on. Okay, so that's what Schur's theorem says, is I have this orthonormal basis. Okay, but now what we want to say is, what can we say about some of the numbers inside of this matrix? Okay, using the hypothesis that T is normal. Well, first of all, we know that what this matrix is telling me, right, is the first basis E1 is sent to A11 times E1. Right, that's what how you interpret what this matrix is saying. Right, so that, remember this is first basis element. It's sent to it with these are the coefficients with respect to the basis elements e1 to the en. Right, so that tells me that the uh, the norm of this vector, right, is equal to the absolute value of a1 squared times the norm of e1 squared but E1 is part of an orthonormal basis, so it has norm one, so we get the absolute value of A1 squared, okay? Now, the adjoint of T has the matrix associated to it, which is going to be the, ad, um, the conjugate transpose of this matrix. So when we take the conjugate transpose of this matrix, the A11, A12, and so on become the first column. So that means that it, the adjoint will take E1, the basis E1, to the element A11 E1 plus A12 E2 up to A1N En. Okay, and so then we can figure out the norm of this vector. And because everything is an orthonormal, all these vectors are orthonormal, uh, we get that this is equal to the length of a1 squared plus a1 two squared all the way up to the uh, length uh, or the absolute value of a1n squared. Okay, now one of the properties of normality is that this fact right here is that if t is a normal vector, it takes any vector, t evaluated any vector and taking its norm is the same as the norm of the adjoint to that same vector, okay? And then, and then we can add the squares there if we need it. But we've actually computed these two guys, right? So on this side, we have a11 squared, and on this side, we have the length of a11 squared plus a12 squared, all the way out to a1, uh, the length of a1 n squared. So the two sides are are equal. But now these are both positive in, uh, or non-negative integers. So this, all of these numbers here have to be zero, right? So we get that a1, oops, that a1 two up to a1 n is all equal to zero. Okay. So going back, um, oh, and I guess I could. And this happens then if a12 up to a1n is zero. So going back to my matrix over here, what we've shown is that all of these guys here are equal to zero, okay? And now we know that we have a zero here and we only have a22 in this column and now we repeat the argument on the next column. OK, 
Okay, so we repeat for the other entries on the diagonal. So then we would show the next clump over here off of the diagonal is zero. And then we show the next clump after that is zero. So we repeat for all other entries. And at the end of the day, you're just going to be left with the diagonal entries. So that with respect to this particular basis, you get a diagonal matrix. So that only, uh, we have to prove one more part. We have to show the reverse implication that C implies A, but we'll do that after the break.